it is an honor to give this invited talk at SAS uh, and opening the conference. Many thanks to Michaela, David, and the PC members for inviting us. This is joint work by Victor, Pedro, Maximiliano, Jose, and myself, Don at the IMDEA Software Institute and UPN. And the idea is to present a quick overview of our parametric resource analysis approach and report on some of our experiences applying it to some contexts, in particular to developing cost analysis for smart contracts. We start with some introduction on the application. Smart contracts are used to perform secure transactions in a distributed setting without the need for third parties. Often contracts and their storage are replicated in every node and any call to a contract is executed on every client. Because of these platforms like Ethereum, Tezos, Tron, et cetera, introduce upper bounds on execution time and storage and associate fees with running a contract or increasing its storage size. Uh, this is basically gas and storage costs. Typically, each instruction of the contract language has an associated cost. Therefore, storage space and computation time are interesting resources to study in these platforms, among others. Knowing before the cost of running a contract in terms of computation time, in terms of increasing storage size, etc., can be very useful for users. For example, they can know how much they will be charged for the transaction. They can know whether the, uh, uh, the gas limits will be exceeded. And this means they will be able to avoid being charged for transactions that do not complete due to gas. Now, most platforms do have uh, simulation and testing facilities, but of course, this will only give you the result for a particular input. It will prove that a particular input does not meet the specifications. But um, you could try a number of cases and then some other case could have a very large consumption and you may not catch it. So in that sense, we would like to obtain guaranteed bounds statically and through some combination of static and, and possibly dynamic, hopefully static methods. So basically only uh, formal methods give us an answer for this and basically abstract interpretation or proof systems uh, can prove that a program does comply with specifications for an infinite set of possible inputs. So we will do that. We will try in particular abstract interpretation. Now, um, what are the challenges in this, in this uh, context? Well, we are addressing one challenge, uh, which is the following. There are other tools that infer gas costs, for example, Gastap and Gazol and MathMax, but they tend to be platform or language specific. On the other hand, smart contract platforms change very rapidly. Uh, there are changes in the cost model, there are changes in the language and in the semantics. We have developed uh, an approach called parametric resource analysis and a set of tools that implement this approach within uh, ChowPP, and we have used them uh, for the development of resource analysis in a rapid way in many contexts, including uh, resources like time, memory, energy, etc., and for different kinds of uh, input languages. So we believed that applying this uh, method uh, in this very changing concept would be a good idea. And this is what we do in this uh, case study that we are presenting. Apply, uh, study the applicability in this context with a concrete case study, the Tezos blockchain platform and its Mikkelsen language of our parametric uh, resource uh, approach. So our first part of the talk will be devoted to this parametric resource analysis approach. The Objective of resource analysis is to statically and automatically infer and verify upper and lower bounds in the usage that a program makes of resources. This can be um, execution steps, data sizes, time memory, the classic ones, but also user-oriented or application-oriented resources like bits sent or received over the socket, SMSs, database accesses, procedure calls, files left open, money and gas spent. These are application-dependent and user-defined. Now, resources in general, can have different characteristics. They can be platform dependent or independent. They can be cumulative or non-cumulative. They could be, uh, we will be interested in inferring actual bounds with concrete constants or asymptotic bounds. Or applications often use the actual bounds or need the actual binds. Um, and, and they have also many applications uh, resources. Uh, for example, performance debugging, performance verification, certification of performance, security, absence of side channels, um, identification or finding attack targets, uh, resource-oriented optimization or resource-driven optimization, granularity control in parallelism, which was our first motivation for all these uh, resources work. Of course, contract gas. No? 
basically it's an area where much progress has uh, been made since uh, Beck Bright's uh, landmark paper. Um, they were the com first complete analyzers in, in the 90s. I put some of our reference there. And then there's a lot of re re recent work you know, in, in this. And we have plenty of talks in SAS and uh, invite talks even, um, on, on the topic. Um, so um, some characteristics and challenges of uh, resource analysis. Um, this is a simple program, a, a filter in, in C. Um, and the interesting thing here is that it has an input uh, value elements and uh, then a loop that loops over the elements and then some uh, if then else's. So if we look at this, um, the cost of this program depends on the value of elements. There's, there's no way to uh, produce a concrete number, I mean, uh, out of this. So we, what we want to do is infer functions. So what is the cost as a function of some characteristics of the input, which is what we call the metric or the size of the inputs. In this case, it would be the size of elements, which in this case is a, is a, is a number, but it could be an array or it could be anything else. Uh, this is a bit of a difference with the uh, worst case execution time analysis and, and related methods. You know? Also, um, this sort of uh, resource consumption analysis is undecidable in general, of course, so we have to resort to approximations and we like safe approximations. So we would like to infer, um, um, infer upper and lower bounds and that as accurately as possible. So what is the solution for that is abstract interpretation, of course. So. Uh, if we do the analysis of this program, what we want to obtain is a pragma like that one, a true assertion that tells us that the energy consumption is between this and that, between this lower bound and that lower bound. And in this case, a function is there two lines uh, and our memory consumption is between those two lines. Great. Now, um, the other uh, or the important as aspect of our resource analysis is parametricity. Now, parametricity means that the programmer can define the resource analysis. In, in our approach, um, if the programmer defines the resource consumption of the basic elements, the instructions, the bytecodes, the libraries, the macros of the, the language. This is what we call the cost model. And then the system infers the research bound functions for the rest of the program by integrating those, uh, the cost of the, of the primitives. And uh, for us, this resource bound function are in the form of call pattern resource uses function pairs in the sense that for a certain call and in fact, a certain path uh, to a, a point in the program, we get a certain uh, function call. Well, I'll talk later about accumulated cost, which is a bit different, but um, anyway. So this is done via these uh, trust assertions that we see in the figure, you know, where we say that um, for, um, I mean, the description of the cost of each individual instruction is done with this uh, trust assertion. So we say that for um, a given in operation, we define a cost, we define what approximation we're giving, if it's, a, it's an upper bound or a lower bound and so on. We give the name of the resource that we're talking about. And then we give a, an, an expression that can be linear, um, exponential, uh, logarithmic, uh, and, and so on, uh, with constants and, and so on, that describes the cost and, and that is uh, of that operation, and that is a function of the arguments to that operation. Here you see an example for a very simple operation like append, where we see that uh, the cost of append in the resource steps that we that we define depends on the length of the input list, and and the value is actually length of x plus one. So this is how we describe uh, the parametricity, how we describe the cost of of a primitive operation or of any operation, by the by the way, but in this case. For example, if we have this uh, naive reverse uh, example and we're doing our steps, um, then uh, we would infer things uh, like this, you know, like this statement here. Now, these are true statements because they have been inferred, they have been proved correct by the, by the analyzer. And these statements say, for example, things about the, the number of steps, which is the resource that we defined of the program. And you're saying that, um, for example, the uh, append one, um, uh, predicate that we have there uh, in steps, you know, basically will do the same number of steps as the length of uh, of the list, and that um, uh, reverse, you know, will do. This is the naive reverse, it's quadratic, so it would do exactly one half l square plus three halves of l plus one, where l is the length of the, of the input list. Furthermore, we also infer the sizes of arguments because these are instrumental to be able to go to the next step in the in the program to you know. Since every part of the program, uh, the cost is, uh, depends on the size of inputs, then you have to have the outputs from the previous parts of the program to, 
to, uh, to compute the cost. So it's very important to, to infer output sizes. So here in this case, we are inferring that the output from uh, reverse is the, uh, the output list Y is also a list of the same length as, uh, as the input. Or for example, that the uh, output from append one is a list that is one longer than the input list. This is a table that gives uh, examples of resources that can be defined with the parametric resources approach. There's a bunch of researchers of different kinds uh, from uh, insertions and deletions, uh, disk movements, arithmetic operations, bytes read or, or written and so on. As you can see, there's all kinds of different um, uh, functions, the, you know, linear, uh, quadratic, polynomial in general, uh, exponential, etc. These are other examples, for example, these, these are from uh, Java programs by analyzing the, the bytecode. Again, you see many um, uh, application oriented like uh, bandwidth require or SMSs, for example, it's for, was for a, a phone code. Um, energy consumption in, the, in this case, I'll talk about that in a, in a, in a second. So these are uh, again, different cost functions, resources, size metrics, type of, types of loops and so, and so on. So um, a brief, uh, pass about how we do the, the static uh, resource analysis in, in Chow PP. Well, the first step is that we have to perform all the supporting analysis. I mean, so this is the size types and shapes. This is necessary for uh, knowing your size metrics. How can you measure the size? Or what are the relevant sizes of your data structures? Typically, you also have to do some kind of sharing or aliasing analysis for if you have pointers and so on for correctness to ensure that you don't have aliasing or if you have it or if, and so on. Um, you, you, probably must do um, an exception analysis or non failure analysis in the case of logic languages. And this is typically necessary to infer um, non-trivial uh, lower bounds, you know, because you know that you're not going to stop the execution, you're actually going to progress. And uh, determinacy, mutual exclusion, elimination of determinacy always helps, of course, to obtain uh, tighter bounds. So all these are uh, intervening analysis or previous analysis uh, that you have to do. Then once you have all the, that information, you set up recurrence equations first, on the sizes, so the uh, in, in in this approach, the, the first thing is um, um, solve the sizes. So you set a recursive equations for the size of each relevant output argument as a function of input data sizes, which was maybe non-deterministic. The size metrics, as I said, are derived from the inverse shape information uh, or, or types. Uh, data dependency graphs determine the relative sizes of variable contents. Um, and with that, we compute solutions to these recursive equations by bounding them. So getting depending on where we're doing upper or lower bounds um, to obtain output argument sizes of uh, procedure calls or built-ins, et cetera, as a function of input um, argument sizes. And then using uh, the recur recurrent solver, this could be the internal recurrent solver or uh, we have interfaces with Mathematica, with Parma, with Pubs, with MATLAB, and so on. Uh, plus other techniques like ranking functions or polynomial techniques, uh, um, etc. Then we infer the solutions to these um, uh, recurrence equations. So, so this, then you get things like this, for example, to prove that the size of the uh, list uh, uh, that is produced by CONCAT is the sum of the two uh, input lists. Now, then you would repeat the process for the actual cost for the resources, no? Because uh, so we use these size uh, uh, functions to set up recurrence equations representing the computational cost of each resource uh, in each block of the program, and we compute again bounds of the solutions with the same same techniques, and with that we obtain the resource uh, usage functions. Now, what techniques do we use to do the intervening analysis first? Well, um, for that, we use our standard analysis framework, the, the Chow PP generic framework, which basically is an efficient incremental abstract OLDT resolution algorithm for constrained horn clauses. Um, it's basically the, what we call the, the top-down algorithm, the original top-down algorithm uh, that we um, proposed in the, late, uh, in the late 80s and, and is still in, in, in use. Um, it maintains basically a call answer table with dependencies, which represents specializations. For each call, you, you have a corresponding success is multivariant in the sense that uh, you have different calls and different successes for each 
predicate or each program program point. They also has paths and so on. Um, and uh, anyway, so it, it keeps dependencies uh, through these tables. Characteristics, precision. So it is context and path sensitive and it has multivariance, but it does it in an efficient way to, uh, through tabling and so on. Uh, a lot of techniques for um, efficiency, memoization, dependency tracking, strongly detection of strongly connected components, et cetera, base cases, or all these things are there in the, um, in the system. Um, genericity, so it's, it's really a generic system in the sense that the um, uh, domains are plugins. Um, it's configurable in many ways. It, uh, it has, of course, you can plug in the widenings and it has several places, the call widening and success widening and so on. Uh, that you can that you can plug in, it handles mutually recursive methods, library calls, externals. It can be guided with assertions. So if in any point you want to improve the information that um, that it, um, yeah, you, you can talk to the analyzer through, through assertions and, and get it to compute a tighter a tighter fixed point. Um, it can um, and then it has two interesting characteristics that uh, I. I um, hope to be able to cover at the end. Uh, modular, it is. Uh, it, it treats modules separately, and, and uh, with that, it achieves a reduction of the working set. And incremental, which means that it reduces. You can remember past analysis and, and reuse information so that only the minimum amount of work uh, is done. Now, another uh, detail about the resource analysis. Um, uh, we have incorporated the resource analysis into the abstract interpretation engine so that uh, the analysis itself, the resources is a domain, is an abstract domain of partial functions, basically. Um, and uh, so, so it's now a, a, a one of the ply plugins. This gives us all the advantages of being inside the, the fixed point, let's say, which is the multivariance, the uh, easier combination with other domains, of course, uh, maintaining all versions and so on, easier integration with static de debugging and verification, uh, with runtime checking. So it, it just fits into the, 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 whole, um, the whole model. No? And a lot of engineering advantages. Another detail of, um, uh, of the system is that it uses size types. So when we infer shapes, we also infer annotate the shapes with, uh, with, with the sizes. So every point or every will have um, upper and lower bounds. So for example, if we talk about a list, to, to give a simple example, uh, it will be a list whose length is between this lower bound and upper bound of elements, each of which is within this bound and that bound. An important characteristic of the system is that we support different languages and compilation levels. And this is done by program transformation. So the idea is to have an inter internal, intermediate, sorry, um, uh, representation in horn clauses. Uh, this uh, process can also be seen as abstract compilation. And uh, the idea is that the horn clauses capture the semantics of the original program. This is a very popular method now, nowadays, right? Um, so the, the, the source is the program, the target is a, a, a set of horn clauses. Um, and, and in practice, there's, uh, you know, there's the big step semantics, the small step semantics and so on. But uh, the method that works best most of the time for us is that in the end, a block in the, in the control for graph is a horn clause. And we'll see examples of, of that. Now to get to that point, to get from the original program um, to the horn clause representation, this can be done by partial evaluation uh, using the Futamura projections and so on. And for that, we can also use the Chow PP partial evaluator or Michael Loisch's one, et cetera. Um, or John Gallagher's, uh, or it can also be done directly. You can also write the compiler directly. Huh? And we use that for all the analysis, con uh, uh, class hierarchy analysis, shape types, data sizes, and resources. So this is going to be a part of our um, parametric resource approach, the uh, translation into constraint horn clause intermediate representation. This is a very simple example of this process. Uh, we transform here an XC binary uh, um, program in assembly. And we um, basically go through a process, which is first we uh, recognize the, the blocks and the connections between the, the blocks. We make the translation to uh, con um, constraint horn clauses. Here you see how each clause represents um, a corresponds to a block and uh, sides of if then else's or case statements or conditionals and so on end up being clauses of the same predicate. Then, this combined with a model, a cost model, uh, which is 
a set of assertions. Remember the, the parametricity. So these are the assertions that describe the primitives. So in this case, we describe the individual instructions, as you can see there, of the, of the assembly language. And for each of those instructions, we give upper and lower bounds of the energy consumption. These are real uh, energy, energy values uh, checked against hardware and so on. And with that, if we return to our uh, FIR program, we can see, um, well, we have the true, that this allows us to um, um, infer that true information, the green information, it allows us to infer that true information um, directly, but also we can do uh, verification in the sense that if we have an assertion like the blue one, the, che the check assertion, which is giving us a specification, which it says that the energy consumption has to be within this limit, within, um, these, these values of, of element, then we can compare that against the inferred information and get um, results like this, where we identify, the, the system identifies that for a certain uh, interval of input value, of, of values of elements between one and 20 in particular, the assertion, the specification is proved correct, is checked, and for other values, it's false. And in fact, there could be also ranges where we don't know if it's uh, uh, true or false. With this, we finished with the first part, with the review of the parametric resource analysis approach. And we tackled the second part, uh, the case study and analyzer for Mikkelsen gas and storage. So our, in our problem here, the source will be a Mikkelsen program or some higher level uh, source that has been compiled to Mikkelsen, and the output will be gas and storage consumption bounds for entry points and internal blocks as functions of the entry parameters of the contract. And the basic steps will be following the approach. We will develop an if, first an interpreter for Mikkelsen, and for this we will transliterate directly the semantics of the instruction definitions in the Mikkelsen specification. We will develop a compiler of Mikkelsen into Chow PPs a uh, constraint hold clauses intermediate representation based on a partial evaluation of the interpreter. We will develop a gas model for Mikkelsen's instructions and we'll feed it all to the ChowPP analyzer. Now, we start with a quick review of the Mikkelsen language. It is the native language used by the Tezos plat platform. It's interpreted, it's strongly typed, and it's stack based. Despite being a bit low level, uh, it still uses some high-level data structures like lists, sets, maps, begins, and, and others. A Mikkelsen contract has uh, three sections. We can see an example. Um, the first section is the parameter section, which gives us the type of the input argument. The next one is the storage section, which gives us the type of the storage. The third one is the code section, which has a sequence of instructions to be executed by the interpreter. And the interpreter is a pure function that receives a stack and returns another stack without altering its, uh, its environment. The input stack basically contains only a pair, parameter storage, which is the initial uh, value of the parameter and the initial value of the storage. And then the output stack is also basically a pair that has a list of blockchain operations and the new storage produced after the, the execution of the contract. The Mikkelsen instructions can also be seen as pure functions uh, receiving an input stack and returning a result stack. The table shows the semantics of the Mikkelsen instructions used in the previous example of reversing a list. As an example, we'll see that nil inserts an empty list on top of the stack. Now we have to provide the type of the elements that we will be pushing. Swap exchanges the top two elements of the stack. And as an example of a more complex instruction, iter traverses the element of a list performing an action indicated by its arguments, which can be a macro or a sequence of instructions. There are other instructions we receive code as an argument. For example, control structures in the language, such as if or loop, uh, these are instructions that receive one or two blocks of code. Other instructions receive other kinds of arguments, such as nil, which receives the type of the list to be built, or push, which receives the type of the value of the element uh, placed on the stack. As a concrete example, a call to this contract with a list of numbers from one to three as parameter would present the following input and output stacks, as you can see here. Note that as the first instruction car in the contract discards the storage, the value of the storage at the beginning is in, in irrelevant to obtain the result of the computation. The first step then is to translate uh, Mikkelson into constraint horn clauses. Here we see the same 
table as before, defining some Mikkelsen instructions, and we have the equivalent representation in as Herbrand terms in the horn clause representation. Uh, if we look, for example, the swap instruction, you can see that the input stack and the output stack are represented by list, and you see how the um, elements are swapped. You can also see how the first element is taken in the car instruction, etc., and the iter instruction is implemented through a recursive loop in the in the horn clause program. So, as we have said, we implement the semantics as a big step recursive interpreter, a direct transliteration of the semantics into constraint horn clauses where the data structures are represented with Herbrand terms. And here you can see um, a sketch of the of the interpreter. Run takes the input program and the initial stack and reduces it by executing the sequence uh, the sequence of Mikkelsen instructions to obtain the resulting stack. And ins is the instruction dispatcher, which connects ins instruction term, which is CHC definition as we saw in the previous in the previous table. As preliminary transformations, we introduce label blocks for sequences of instru instructions in the program to help in later steps of the partial evaluation. And we consider them simply as new predicate definition. We also rely on a simple, implement implement a simple implementation within the system of the Mikkelson type checking. And this makes knowing the type of uh, the stack at each program point a decidable problem. This allows us to specialize the polymorphic instructions depending on the type of the past arguments. And it's particularly useful to specify, as we will see later, the semantics and cost of each instruction variant, which, one, which can vary depending on those static types. We have here an example of the add instruction, which is translated into one of seven possible primitive operations depending on the type of the operands. Now, based on our interpreter, we derive, we derive stepwise a simple translator, which combines a handwritten specializer for the run uh, predicate uh, the stack deforestation passed, uh, including each stack element instead of the stack itself as predicate arguments, and a generic partial evaluation for the primitive instruction definitions. For example, we evaluate conditions, arithmetic instructions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Mickelson control flow instructions receive both the control condition and the code to execute as inputs. The code arguments are bound to new constants representing code blocks dispatched from in street. For each call, Partial evaluation will unfold the if instruction and generate new instances, as we can see in the example. The stack deforestation step is especially useful in the output of control flow instructions, which receive an argument for each element in the input and the output stack, as you can also see in, this, in the figure. This transformation is possible thanks to Mikasol semantics, which forbids changes to the type of the stack in loops and forces the type of both output stacks in branch instructions to match. To capture the actual cost of instructions while using techniques mentioned um, here, we introduce um, an extension of the instruction definitions using cost markers. Partial evaluation will replace each of the primitive operations by its uh, constrained horn clause definition, and the cost markers will be preserved to keep a record of the consumed um, resources at each step. As a result of the transformation, some Mikkelson instructions that simply modify or access a stack will not even be represented in the output, only their cost markers if they are uh, relevant. In this example, an additional transformation is performed. Two different predicates are generated for each Mikkelson entry point to the contract. And as a result, we obtain a CHC in representation of the contract that has two predicates which can be analyzed independently. Apart from this one, as we can see, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between both programs. The next stage in our approach is to obtain the cost model. There are several ways to obtain such a cost model. We can use an already defined cost model provided by a platform, or we can extract it from the source code of the platform by program slicing, using a static uh, analysis tool, or even manual extraction. Now, the Tesos Mikkelson gas model has several uh, components. In ChowPP's term, this is a compound resource. It's what we call a compound resource. Our cost model must be able to express gas as a function that depends on other uh, Tezos resources. In particular, gas depends on allocations, steps, reads, writes, bytes read, and bytes written with the expression that is uh, shown there. Here we can see uh, the model expressed with uh, Chow assertions, actually for two versions of the cost model, uh, of the Tesos platform, the Carthage, which is the previous one, and Delphi, which is the current one. As you can see, the, uh, the assertions, the Chow assertions, are just a transliteration of the model as it is defined. 
Another thing that is important in the, in the cost model definition is to define other details like the sizes of the output uh, in terms of the input for every operation, for every instruction. Once we have a cost model and the representation of the contract as um, a cost in constraint horn clauses, we can simply use Chow PP to perform the resource analysis and all the auxiliary analysis it requires, which are shown there in the figure. Here you can see a simple Mikkelson contract that performs some arithmetic operations. And here you can see the constraint horn clause uh, representation. You can see uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the um, instructions in the Mikkelson contract and the instructions in the constraint horn clauses. And, but you can also see the markers, the cost markers, etc. This is the cost information produced by Chow PP for the example program. As you can see, a correct upper bound is inferred for the size of the output argument. And also, thanks to um, the cost model that we develop, an upper bound on gas consumption is inferred. It's actually log A squared plus 2B, uh, where A is the parameter and B is the storage. We provide in the paper some performance results, some of which we reflect here. We have tried to cover a reasonable range of Mikkelson data structures and control flow instructions, as well as different cost functions uh, using different metrics. Uh, many optimizations and improvements are possible, as well as, as uh, much more comprehensive benchmarking. But we believe that the results shown suggest that relevant bounds can be obtained in reasonable times. And given the relative simplicity of the development, that uh, we argue supports our expectations regarding the advantages of uh, taking our approach. Uh, regarding scalability, um, well, since the resource analysis is an abstract domain, it inherits all the characteristics of the general analyzer. So this includes efficient multivariance, dependency tracking, multiple specialization, and many provisions with scalability that uh, we have not, we haven't been able to cover yet. I'll, I'll try to do a very brief pass over a few of them. Uh, something Things like fine-grained incremental and modular analysis, user guidance to assertions, adaptable widenings, and other characteristics that are, are inherited from the Chow PP framework. Verification, static debugging, abstraction carrying code, all these come for free. There are other characteristics of our resource analysis that are also can also be very useful in this context and also come with the framework. Especially accumulated costs and static profiling, so we'll be able to know just what, not just what is the cost of um, a call to a, to a function, but also how much of the total cost of an application accumulates in a function. This is what we have called accumulated cost. Also verification of admissible overheads to have specifications on changes in overheads. For example, if you under, on, uh, introduce runtime tests and so on. Anyway, to conclude, we argue that our parametric analysis and our translation to constraint horn clauses approaches offer a quick development path for cost analyzers in general and for smart contracts in particular. We have applied it to the third, uh, Tezos platform and its Mikkelson language as test cases. The tool developed infers statically the desired gas storage cost functions. The results are correct and reasonably accurate and running times are quite good. And our flexible approach, we believe it's uh, very useful in environments that are have rapid change. You know. And blockchain technology is one of them because you have new languages, new cost models, and so on. In fact, as I mentioned in passing, while preparing the, the talk, a new protocol was uh, released by Tezos. And for us, um, we, we just had to update the cost model. It's something that was done in hours. The hour, the, the, the time went basically in understanding what the changes were, not in, not in encoding them. And we just had to modify cost assertions. We have to touch a line of the code. We would like to thank uh, Vincent Potball, Mehdi Baziz, and Raphael uh, Cotelier from Nomadic Lab, and Patrick Cousseau for their very useful uh, comments. And uh, I don't want to finish without mentioning the whole team. I uh, mentioned the co-authors at the beginning, but here you see all the members of our team at IMDEA now, and also some, some previous members. And with that, I'm happy to take questions.